Right. Dr. Flutter, sir. Good evening, Michael. <laughs> Good evening. Okay, we have today, we have talk about the maxilla mm -hmm. and cephalometrics. Yes. And how the maxilla and the cephalometrics sort of can be misleading. What I think it can show is that the cephalometrics are good at showing what they show, mm. but they don't show what we really need to know. And I think what a lot of people think they're showing. Yeah, yeah. They think yeah. they show things which, in fact, cool. they don't show. Yeah, yeah. A, 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 this image is this image, and don't imagine it to be more than what it is, mm -hmm. basically. But they do use it to... Um, determine the abnormality against a set of norms. So they measure lots of measurements and angles and distances, and then that's compared against a normal. So they can detect whether the maxilla has grown to the correct shape or not. In fact, upper and lower jaws, whether they've grown to the correct shape or not. And if they haven't, how what the variation from the correct shape is. Yeah. So this is basically when you're trying to analyze someone, you're trying to make a diagnosis. Yes. Trying to understand where someone is or where someone has gone to from, so from A to B, like the change, mm -hmm. or just where they is. So when you go to have a consultation with an orthodontist, they will take one of these x-rays, they'll analyze this x-ray, and they will use this to determine a treatment. And they'll compare it against a norm. They'll take mm. the numbers and compare it against the norm. Against a data set of other people and then they'll try and change those numbers in treatment to get it closer to the norm yes precisely and we're going to discuss where the validity well some aspects of the validity of mm. that today all right yeah i think it's valid as far as it goes i just don't think it goes far enough mm. Mm. it is what it is it is what it is yeah yeah cool so i like this comment here you say the maxillae have a suture with the frontal bones the nasian now I was going to say that should be the maxilla has a suture, but... There are two maxillae. There are two maxillae, aren't there? Yeah. yeah. We and shouldn't I think forget that, that. We shouldn't forget that, no. And it is often mistaken. Maxilla is often used in the singular. Mm. And it should be the plural, which I've used throughout all my texts. I use as a plural. Cool. Cool. And um, what's particularly important, which I think is missed by many, many people, is the fact that their maxilla does have those two processes, which have a suture at nasion with mm. the frontal bone. Mm. So the maxilla here it goes all the way up to here. All the way up to there, yeah. yeah. You, you're using these terms SNA and BNA. Yeah. Can you give us the quick little lowdown on those? Just a short version. Okay, so it's commonly used in orthodontics to determine the position of the maxilla. Yeah. Because they fail to realise that nasion and A point are two points on the same bone, essentially. Yeah. You simply cannot distinguish between the suture between the nasal bone and the frontal bone and the maxillae and the frontal bone and even the lacrimal bone and the frontal bone. Now, just one yeah. point on the cephalometric x-ray. To, to think you can distinguish them is you, you're deluding yourself if you think you can distinguish yeah, them. No, I think it's a very good point because they're, they're all coming together here, aren't they? At that point, yeah. 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 All these little bones. You know, here, you know, you've got a beautiful classic skull mm. where the frontal bones are ahead of the maxillary bones, and they would normally be ahead, but there's a lot of variation out there. Mm -hmm. The one thing I've learned, though, you start doing research and start trying to get this, you say, I'm going to take this point mm -hmm. on everyone. <laughs> it's not easy to take that point. There's a few, there'll always be a few exceptions where it's hard to get that point. So people tend to imagine the airway as a tube. Mm. And for the most part, it is a tube. Mm. But in the nasal airway, it is merely the space created between the two maxillae. Yeah. So um, this is, you talk about SNA. When we look at a cephalometric x-ray, you can see cella, and it's a really easy point to yeah. see on the yeah. x-ray. I mean, but people don't, uh, some, a lot of people don't understand why we use these points, but this is the point you're making now. Yes. Why we use these points. Well, we use the points because they're easy to identify. Yeah. That's the main reason yeah. you use those points. But then they use those points to try and determine how, what variation there is between 
what that individual patient has against the norms and uh, then to see what change will happen during treatment. So what the individual is in point A and what the individual is in point B. Yes. Mm. Yeah. But they place a big emphasis on SNA. And my point is, is that it doesn't, they use that to say where the maxilla is, but my point is it won't show you where the maxilla is. Mm, if the no. maxilla moves, SNA won't change. Yeah. Well, I just say, we don't say it won't show you. It, it can mislead you. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's a fair way. Yeah, it yeah. misleads you, yeah, yeah. So when you get... So, so this is a cephalometric tracing. That's a cephalometric so x-ray and a tracing. Yeah, exactly. So here you've got the x-ray with the tracing superimposed, and you can see yeah. they've got the points here. Mm. Um, Seller, the nice, easy to spot point, yeah. a yeah. dot in the middle there. Yeah. You've got, this will be basion, basion here. Yeah. So that the basion is the front of the foramen magnum. Absolutely, okay. yeah. So your spinal cord goes yeah. down here, yeah. and you can see the front and back of the hole that leaves in the skull. Yeah. And that's a really obvious hole it leaves. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Here, here is Nasion itself. You know, here's yes. Nasion, and yeah. here's the point that's clearly used. All yeah. of these lines yeah. come to Nasion, yeah. and then you make a line down to, yeah. we're dropping it down to this point A yeah. to yeah. determine in this direction yeah. where the maxilla is. Correct. Where the maxilla is forward or where the maxilla is backwards. And that's misleading. Because we're not considering whether point N. Mm -hmm. moves mm -hmm. or where the point N is in the right place in the first place. That's right. Yeah. And because what the contention is, what we say is, and what <coughs> is evidence to show, that in a malocclusion, both the maxilla and the mandible is retroanathic. Yeah. So even if you see a large overjet like this, then both mandible and maxilla are back from the ideal position. Can we run that one again? So here, here's growth. That's growth and development of the upper and lower jaw, ending up with a malocclusion, with an increased overjet. Yeah. And, and it's, it's that downswing we see at the last bit that's representative of what's going wrong. Yeah. And the thinking is, is that the top teeth are too far forward. So yeah. we track them. Thing. Yeah, exactly. Whereas what we're saying is, is in fact they're too far back and the whole maxilla should be further forwards. So both bones should be further forwards. Yes. Yeah. Because of that downswing you talk about, mm. it swung down and back, whereas ideally it wouldn't have done that. Yeah. And of course, one of the inherent problems here is that the, this malocclusion started, well, about 10,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's been progressing probably in an upward trend. And we took our normative data in the middle of the last century. Yes. Which, you know, yeah. just where does that leave? If you put that foundation stone in that yeah. place, it's going to confuse your thinking. Yeah. But even if you have a sort of a class one relationship, what's considered a class one molar normal, relationship. So yeah. Where you would consider the teeth meet in a normal position. Yeah. Yes. And you end up with a malocclusion like this. Yeah. Even though the molars are in a good position, again, the maxilla and the mandible are retroanatomic. So uh, could we, I could say the molars are in a good relative position. A good relative position. Yeah, okay, yeah. relatively yeah. Right, right. But this comes from Angle, mm -hmm. who used the, the first permanent molar, tooth number six, the biggest tooth in the mouth, mm. as a representative mm -hmm. of where the bone was. Yes. So yes. he was just, he's, he just, it was in his imagination, basically. Yeah. He took a guess. He says, I'm going to use that tooth as a representation of where that bone is. Yeah. But also, we know that if those teeth are in a relative good position, mm -hmm. then all the other teeth will fit together nicely. Yes. Which is the, the objective of most of orthodontics is to line those teeth up. Mm -hmm. So it, it has some validity to it, you know, it has some common sense. Yeah, I mean, given that you have to get a point from somewhere, yeah, it's as good as anywhere. Yeah. What it fails to uh, take into account is the fact that the molars will drift forwards I, independently of each other if deciduous teeth are lost early. Yeah. So that, I mean, that doesn't tell you where the, the jaw bones are if the lower molar has drifted forward half mm. a tooth space. Mm. So the, one of the problems when you don't have the maxilla in the correct position, which is one of our main points, is that if the maxilla is not grown adequately forwards, it will have a restriction within the pharyngeal airway. Mm. So what you basically this the whole this whole bone this, what, no this whole complex yeah the nasomaxillary complex I like to call yeah. it. yeah 
the whole complex is set back. So, of course, mm. that's effectively whatever you've drawn the... Um, can we run that slide again? Well, that's a good one there. So by extending that backwards, that's your representation of everything being set back. Yeah. There's only a limited amount of room between the posterior border of the maxillae and the spinal cord. Yeah, so the back which is of where the, the airway yeah. is. So basically, there's only so much space between the back of the maxilla and the spinal cord. Yeah, and you've got to get a lot of very, very important things yeah. in that space, namely your airway, particularly the airway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, if we see a, a particular patient like this who's got an underdeveloped maxilla, we can see a bilateral posterior crossbite there. Mm. Mm, yeah. So, but so we're looking back here, aren't we? Looking at the lower yeah. teeth on the outside of the upper teeth. Yeah. Lower teeth on the outside of the upper teeth on both yeah. sides. So yeah. normally, lower teeth are inside of upper teeth all the way around. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, and it fails there. And so it's not that difficult to make a top jaw bigger yeah. at this age. Uh, yeah. I would use the BioBlock Stage 1, but there's numerous appliances that would do that. I think the BioBlock Stage 1 is the best, having used numerous appliances over the last 50 years. But I wouldn't quibble with somebody who says they use a different appliance if that's what works well for them yep. i don't quibble with their choice of appliance what i quibble with is what the intention is yeah and what their thinking is behind it yeah 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 but what's so good about the bioblock stage one is that it does transverse and sagittal development very nicely all in one brace all in one brace it allows the tongue to position itself on the soft tissue just behind the upper incisors, mm. what we call the spot, which is thinks a useful thing. Like the end spot, some people call it. The end spot. And the other thing is there's evidence to show that when you de uh, develop a maxillary arch uh, semi-rapidly, you get a forward movement of the mm. maxillae. They yeah. come forwards. I think, you know, that's, even Bjork showed that when you expand the maxilla, it tends to come forward. I've always thought you've got, you've got two pyramids mm -hmm. basically here yeah. and here mm -hmm. they're at the front of the skull mm -hmm. if you move them sideways mm -hmm. they'll come forwards and it's just just dynamics yeah the buttress against the two zygomas exactly, exactly. the two zygomas are good feet. you yeah. know it's going to cause this motion yeah. and it will come forward yeah. yeah and there's evidence from uh, animal studies that shows it happens and people are seeing that a lot with this mse uh-huh yeah you know you've got an adult facelift yeah from doing mse yeah you know, very, some very happy customers. But when you get to this point, once you've got the arch developed like that, the challenge is you get to stay like that. Making mm. an upper jaw bigger is not difficult. Getting it to stay bigger is yeah. very difficult. Yeah. The old phrase, treat the causes of the problem, does help. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So when I'd studied this is back in the 1980s, when we studied with Skip Truitt, we did mm. lots of arch expansion and much of it relapsed. Yeah, as it often does. Often yeah, it's classic. You, know, you, you expand, it relapses. Which is why expansion's but, got a really bad name yes. in orthodontics. I know. Oh, yeah. Really bad name. Because they, they do one step of a two-step process. Mm. The second step, if you want to get to here and you want to maintain that without a, some sort of retainer, is to use the tongue. Yeah, yeah. And the muscles, generally. I think the masticatory muscles help as well. Yes, well, the masticatory muscles help by holding the mouth closed, I guess. Yes. But I think it also f forces stress through the system. Mm -hmm. And the teeth line up mm -hmm. under the stress. So I think there's these two. And I've seen a couple of situations where people, they've got terrible tongue posture, but really good masticatory stress. And I think quite a lot of stress in the system from it. I've seen problems from that. Yeah, yeah. So this is uh, Enlo, mm. and, and he's the master of cranial growth and development. He's the standard textbook. Mm. And he talks the, – the, describe what you see on the picture here with the, okay. the builders okay. here. I, I, I know the slide. I mean, this is being drummed into me from a young um, pre-graduate age. Yeah. So what we have – this is demonstrating the two types – of change that goes on in the bone. Mm -hmm. One is the sort of surface apposition or deposition. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you could get a lump forms on the surface of a bone, mm -hmm. you know, a bone's been added on. And this is demonstrated by these people either taking bone away or adding bone on. Mm -hmm. And of course, then the movement of the trolley <coughs> describes the actual movement of the bones. Mm -hmm. So, 
is always a combination of these two processes. So were I to put a force on the maxilla and I pulled the maxilla forwards, then what I'm getting is, you know, the whole movement, like the whole trolley is moving in one direction. If I was to, um, let's say I could, I could place my tongue on the roof of my mouth and I could gently, gently, gently push my tongue into the roof of the mouth, I would get apposition where the tongue's pushing and I'll probably get deposition on the outside of the bone. So here I've got a totally different type of movement. But he specifically uses these two words, displacement and remodeling, to describe the two features of craniofacial development. Yeah. Okay. And the, the, the importance of that is, is this is also in his textbook, and he talks about the two principal categories of growth movement displacement and remodeling and then this is my highlighting and he says yet to this day this all important facet most of more often than not is totally disregarded when trying to account for how a given appliance or other clinical procedure is presumed to work yeah because it's very easy to see any change in the remodeling and the cephalometric x-rays will show that well but you cannot see the effect of displacement. Okay, you can see the effect of, the combined effect of both of them. Yes. Well, you can't do a separator. That's a much better way of putting it. Yeah, so you can see displacement and remodelling. Yeah. You just didn't know if it was displacement or it was remodelling. Yeah. You've got no idea. No idea. And so the cephalometric accurately shows the variation from the ideal of the remodelling because that's the norms, you have all the norms. Yep. This is the shape of it. This yep. is where it's away from the norm. Yep. But it can't show you how the variation in the displacement, the x-ray won't show that. Yeah, well, you, you can't separate the two. And so I think, you again, you can say, it, you could read this, Keplometric analysis actually shows the variation from the ideal of remodeling and displacement combined, mm -hmm. but not the variation in either separated. Yes, that's probably a better way of putting yeah. it. It is yeah. a better way of putting it, yes. Just to, to recap what I'm saying there, is that the nasomaxillary complex grows dramatically from age 0 to 5 years of age. And uh, by age 5 or 6, when the first permanent molders are erupted, about 90% of the maxillary growth is completed. Mm. And uh, at that point, the position of the maxilla within the cranium is pretty much settled as well. Yes, it's hard to change. I think that this is the strongest argument that you have, particularly when it says here that I don't think that the people who have judged your cases and the people who are judging you at the BOS and so on, I don't think that they, I think they have totally disregarded the effect of uh, displacement and remodeling. I don't think they understand no. And if they're using the cephalometric x-rays to try and show that or try and disprove what you're saying, mm. just in the same way you can't show it... They can't disprove it. They can't disprove it. Works it. both ways. Exactly, yeah. No, I think that's very true. And so if they totally disregard the displacement aspect of your appliances and what you're trying to do, then it's to misunderstand what we're trying to do in general. Yeah, yeah, I mean, because, you know, you, you can't, you, you can't separate the two out no. in, in retrospect, unless you have placed implants in the jaws and follow them. I mean, Bjork's work was trying to find stable structures. And he did demonstrate that um, the unerupted wisdom teeth, the canal, the beginning of the infrared, the, the, the nerve canal, Inferior dental canal. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't mean to most people. The nerve running down here and the internal shape of the inside here. Yeah. There's a little internal shape. He showed that those particular places are relatively stable. But in the maxilla, there was nothing. Next to nothing. He showed the, the front edge of zygomatic buttress. Yeah. Yeah, just lateral, just about here. That seemed to be fairly stable. But mm -hmm. trying to find that on an x ray is just really difficult so effectively there is nothing in the maxilla that you can use 
to determine whether it's been displaced, displaced, or it's been remodeled. Mm-hmm. No idea. Mm-hmm. It, it reminds me when I was in Aarhus in Denmark um, with Professor Melson doing my post grad. We had the school statistician come in. Now, Beatty didn't like this guy. She'd been using this old semi been bringing this guy out of retirement for years and years, and he, he couldn't do it anymore. So she had to use a school statistician. And he had asked us to bring out some papers. In fact, we were given papers. He said he would like us to review papers. I can't remember if I chose this paper or I was given this paper, but I had one on some carefully metrics. And he was laughing at it. And I, it was fr- fr- really refreshing for me to see someone with a completely, un- I guess he was unbiased, the school statistician, just saying what he felt. And he said that if you're going to take all, you know, if you're going to take, you start doing label lists like this, you're setting yourself up for disaster. He says this is one structure. To consider one part doesn't move when you move another part, or one part doesn't move when the other part moves naturally or through growth phases is it's crazy. misleading, misleading, <laughs> misleading is the best word. He said that it's all going to move. Mm-hmm. And what we do here, we do the standard deviations, and but these standard deviations and things are then programmed in, usually you're looking at a one in 20. You're looking at a chance of one in 20. And I see people putting big scientific studies where they've got lists and lists of these variables and they consider anything above a one in 20 to be statistically significant. Well, they're connected to each other. The, the one in 20 assumes a random probability that they're not connected to each other. Mm-hmm. Well, they're all one, sub, they're all one structure. Mm-hmm. They're clearly connected to each other. You can't do that. No. That, that's misleading. Yeah, yeah. You're going to be quickly seeing things that are just chance happening at a far greater than one in 20. Mm-hmm. And that will mislead you. And that happens a lot. Particularly when you've got small sample sizes like 30 to 60. Mm-hmm. You know, if, you, if someone's got sample sizes more, less than 100, you know, you've got to question the work. You look at these medical, proper medical research sample sizes of thousands. That's where you start working out what's happening. Mm-hmm. Not on a sample size of 30 mm-hmm. retrospective cases mm-hmm. I found in my drawer. Mm-hmm. Anyway. So what I thought we could talk about next is the scientific method. Yeah. So <clears throat> these are the six stages of the basic steps if you're using the scientific method to try and uh, make an argument, uh, try and make a scientific argument. Mm. <clears throat> you can see the steps there. And I think that you and John Mew have gone through those steps. It is make an observation, ask a question, form a hypothesis or a testable explanation. Mm. Then you make predictions based on that hypothesis. You test the prediction and then you use those results to make new hypotheses or predictions. Yeah. So I don't think that we've missed, or you and your father have missed any of those steps. No. So let, let's go through those six steps yeah. as you've done yeah. them. So th- what's the observation that we make? Most kids today have got crooked teeth. And it's likely that that's caused by the modern environment. Well, we just make the observation. We, okay. we haven't observation. made that okay. yeah. The observation yeah. is is that historically almost no one had crooked teeth yep. and now almost everybody yep. has crooked yep. teeth. An excellent observation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And particularly it's more prevalent in the developed world than the underdeveloped world. Much more. So when I go to uh, less developed parts of the world and I go to rural communities, like when I go into the... Uh, Himalayas in Nepal or go to uh, remote parts of Africa. Yeah. By and large, the, the, the children and the adults have got well-developed jaws and straight teeth. Yeah, yeah. And that's very, very well backed up by research. And if I go to almost any urban environment in the developed or the underdeveloped world, most of the children have got irregular teeth. Yeah. 
Yeah. Slightly less than the less developed world, but they are catching up fast. Yeah. So we have to ask the question then is why has that occurred? That's the yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah. And so then we come to make the hypothesis. And I think the hypothesis is the tropic premise. Yes. So what, what's the tro tropic premise say? The ideal development of the jaws and teeth is dependent on correct oral posture with the tongue resting on the palate, the lips sealed, and the teeth in light contact for between four and eight hours a day. Okay. It's a hypothesis. Yeah, so that's yeah. our hypothesis. You, know, you so, put something forward and to be tested. Yeah, so what we've done is we've made an observation, we've asked a question, and we've formed a hypothesis. Mm. Yeah, excellent work. So, yeah, excellent work. So then we make predictions based on the hypothesis. So if we can, so the, some of the predictions are, if, for instance, we develop an upper arch mm. and train the tongue to support that, then it's stable. Mm. That would be one test of it, yeah. wouldn't it? What other tests do you think we might do? What other predictions could we uh, um, uh, but base on the hypothesis? What other predictions could we make? Well, if you um, leave your lips resting apart to a great extent, mm -hmm. you will have a narrower maxilla. Yeah. Okay. Which seems to hold true. And if your mouth is apart, what I would maintain is that the tongue and the lower jaw are the same structure. The tongue and the mandible cannot move independently of each no, other. No, no. So if the mouth is open and the tongue is low, then the mandible will be down and back inevitably. Yeah, yeah. So another prediction we might make is that if we get inadequate forward growth of the maxilla, we're going to have a restriction in the pharyngeal airway. That's a prediction. Yeah. And we could say that if we've got an underdeveloped maxillary arch, we've got a restriction in the nasal passages. That would be another prediction, wouldn't it? Mm. So how can we test the prediction? We can test the prediction clinically by developing a maxilla and training the tongue into the palate. Yes, by trying to treat it. But then how can we demonstrate that we're improving the nasal airway. I think that's easier than the pharyngeal airway because if you take mm, a, I guess, yeah, yeah, it is. Easy. If you take a PACF, you can see that. I take PAC, I take PACFs before treatment routinely, and that shows you the narrowness or the reduced space mm. between mm. the two maxillae. Mm. Mm. If the maxillae are, are, are small, demonstrated by irregular teeth then the space between the two maxilla is going to be reduced, which means the nasal airway is reduced. Mm. So we can test the prediction, and we can do that clinically, and we can do that doing it ourselves. And uh, how many countries in the world have you taught your techniques? Uh, uh, I mean, me personally, um, quite a lot. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I could go on a list. But my mm. father, of mm. just about every country I can conceive. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think he'd been all over the world. Yeah. Problem is, it's hard work. Hard work? To do orthotropics. To do orthotropics is hard work, but... Ch to change people is hard. Yeah, it is. But we can, don't have to use necessarily orthotropics to test the prediction no i mean you could test these predictions with lots of different groups you know you yeah. can look at um, animal models you can look at experiments of nature mm -hmm. you can look at existing research mm -hmm. and what people have done yeah. and what was interests me is that the tropic premise mm -hmm. craniofacial dystrophy and orthotropy the general orthotropics concept mm -hmm. stands up to basically every piece of science i've seen yeah you know, any, any quality piece of science I've seen, yeah. it stands up. Yep. No one's ever shown... No one's ever, ever shown... Ever disproved it. No one's ever disproved it at all. In fact, no one has ever given it a meaningful scientific anal analysation. No. Ever. And then the last point, we use the results to make new hypotheses or predictions, and I think that's where we come on to airway. Yep. Snoring. Yep. Sleep apnea. Yep and neurological development, mm, mm. like the uh, neurological development of children 
who have sleep apnea is their cognitive development has been shown scientifically to be reduced. Yeah. Like the cognitive development yeah. of a seven-year-old is the equivalent of a six-year-old if they have sleep what was it? apnea. David Gozell did this research where, I think if I'm right, they offered a group of school children uh, who had been diagnosed with sleep apnea um, CPAP. Mm -hmm. Some of them took the CPAP offer up, some didn't. So they had a control group. Mm -hmm. And a year later, I think they'd got a 10-point increase in IQ. Right. That's unheard of. There, there, yeah. no, no one has ever managed a 10-point IQ increase by any method before. Or, except breathing through your nose at night. Except, well, well, these guys were actually weren't breathing through nose at night. They were having it rammed in their mouth with okay. a CPAP machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, it, yes, it kind of proves a point. Yeah, yeah. Breathing properly, yeah. getting enough air. Yeah. not suffocating at night. Yeah. This is the point that I wanted to make when we're talking about the tropic premise and the fact that the mouth is open. If the mouth is open, the tongue isn't in the palate. What I've never managed to get people to understand really well is that if the tongue drops, the mandible must move with it. You cannot distinguish the one from the other when it comes uh, to well, movement. Where, 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 when the tongue drops, the mandible moves with it. Yeah, the tongue and the mandible move as one yeah, unit. Yeah, I, I can imagine the tongue could drop inside the mouth without the mandible moving. Ah, okay, I'll rephrase that then. If the lips are apart, if you've got a mouth open posture and the back teeth aren't in contact, it's difficult to have a mouth open posture with your back teeth in contact. So if the mouth is, if you lose lip seal, mm. the mandible will drop. Yep. And it'll take the tongue with it. Yeah, well, we could be a bit Or the tongue will go down, it'll take the mandible with it. They, they move as a they single do. unit. But to put it simply, if the mouth falls open, the tongue is likely to come off the palate. Yes. Yes, simply, it has to. But more than that, it takes the mandible with it. It's the movement of the, ma it's the mandible effect. The idea that the mandible moves independently of the tongue. Mm. But it can't do. It, it can't do. Tongue. No. I mean, it's, it's just one structure. It's impossible to move in. Yeah. So if you've got your mouth open and the tongue has dropped from the palate, the yes. mandible will be down and back as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And more importantly from our understanding is once the teeth are no longer in contact, the mandible and the masticatory muscles are no longer supporting the maxillae. Yes, yes. So that's what starts your downward and backward rotation that you talk about. So I talk maxillae. here, I talk about the direct and the indirect forces of mastication. But I know, I, the, indirect, the direct and indirect forces are holding the maxilla up. The direct force being the tongue, on the roof of the mouth because it's directly contact and the indirect forces being the teeth biting together so it's the force through the teeth onto the maxilla and these are the two forces holding it up when those two forces pass me again so the direct force is the tongue on the roof of the mouth yeah the indirect force is a masticatory effect through the teeth into the maxilla mm -hmm. And those are the two forces holding the maxilla up mm -hmm. and restraining its growth. So if the maxilla is under tight control if you're biting together a lot. Mm -hmm. And so no, the tongue's on the roof of the mouth and you're biting together a lot. Then the maxilla will, can only really go forward. So the maxilla goes forwards and the mandible follows it. Okay. And if the tongue's hanging down and the teeth are in contact, then the, the maxilla drops down. And of course, the mandible only closes until it meets the maxilla. That's the definition of its position. You know, it's a moving bone, but it's hinged from this point here. So if the maxillas drop down, the mandible will only close, will close less. And you don't notice that because that's how your face grown. And then effectively the whole thing drops down. That's a, a downswing in form. But in traditional thinking, there's no relationship between tongue position and mandib mandibular position. They yeah. don't consider that. Well, people, the, the, the traditional, traditional orthodontics isn't really thinking about the tongue very much. <laughs> Not at all, no. Which is, which is strange, because we know that the teeth sit in this balance between the lip and the tongue. In a way, you could describe all of orthodontic therapy as fighting the soft tissue balance. Mm -hmm. 
the whole thing. But the argument is, is that the soft tissue follows the anatomical structure. They say when you've got a large overjet, then you get a lip trap. Not you get a lip trap and then you get a large yeah, overjet. Yeah, you see, with the, the, they've got this concept, the, the, the running concept now that the narrative I see within conventional orthodontic thinking is that the genetics control the general skeletal structure, mm-hmm. the, the rough positions of the bones mm-hmm. is genetic, and then the position of the teeth is the environment. Yeah. Incorrect position of the bones mm-hmm. is due to genetics, not environment. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think it's the environment. Correct growth is purely genetic. Mm-hmm. So if you get perfect growth, mm-hmm. it's likely you had a perfect environment and you mm-hmm. got perfect genetic expression, mm-hmm. as we refer to it, full genetic expression. Mm-hmm. If you have a problem, is that problem, that incorrect growth, due to genetics or the environment? And I think the research has answered that question 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. Just clinical probably longer than that. Clinical practice, well, it doesn't want to change. And that's a problem. And one of the other ways I put it is, what I say is, is that every child has the genetic potential to grow ideal jaws and mm. well-aligned yeah. teeth. They have yeah. the genetic potential. Uh, well, 99.8%. Okay. There might be a small proportion. Yeah, yeah. there's some unlucky few. Yeah, who do have odd conditions that yeah, prevent that, prevent by and large. Yeah. And then a few people are going to, you know, be bitten by a saber-toothed tiger or, um, you know, fall on an iron or, you know, there's, some un- you know. Yeah. Yeah, there are some unlucky people as well. Got, yeah. yeah. But. Or burnt or but something. But when you see this, uh, uh, what I see there is two of the problems I think we're facing. One is that the mouth is open the tongue is low, mm. so it won't be supporting the maxilla. Yep. Yes, I totally growth. agree with that. And the other point is, is that they're mouth breathing, and therefore they're much more likely to be snoring and have sleep apnea. There's going to be breathing issues, mm. just the fact mm. that their mouth is open and breathing through the night. Mm. Well, you know, this breathing through the nose, um, I saw a search, research party paper recently i've got i collect everything trouble is i I just don't know where the things are that i've collected because it gets thrown in the general um yeah i understand yes (laughs) it was a research paper talking about the fact that if you mouth breathe you're more likely to get allergic than if you nose breathe so air coming through the nose is less likely to cause allergic reactions than air coming through the mouth and it reminds me of something we found out in orthodontics interestingly that if you have a nickel allergy and you wear orthodontic appliances, the the brackets particularly, that contain nickel, it will reduce your allergy. And they divide the the sort of thinking behind this is that, you know, your your GI tract, so your your gastrointestinal system, Mm. starts here at the vermilion border. So everything in down here to your bottom is considered the um, the gastrointestinal anal tract, and everything outside here is your skin. Right? And there, you know, it's, it's all outside of you. My mouth is still out. My fingers still outside of me, but it's there because it, that's considered outside in theory within the body. Now, if something comes through your skin, it's going to cause probably an IgG reaction that is basically saying, "Hey." Where did this stuff come from? You know, this is, this is not, this, it, it ain't on the guest list. You know, we need to put up a strong reaction, get mm. some boys down here, quick, urgent, get it out. Everything, you know. Whereas if something comes in your mouth, it goes through the um, mucosa within your gut and it gets labeled with an IgA marker, which is basically you're on the guest list. You were chosen to be eaten, it probably is okay. We'll give it the benefit of the doubt, you know, till we work out that it's it's not good. So you get a completely different reaction if something comes through. You you chose to eat it or you came through your skin. Now, taking this into the nasal airway, so what you've got here is something has 
come in through your nose and there's some sort of process goes on in the nose. I mean, we know that you've got huge lymph system in the nose, you know, those tonsils and adenoids that we all get ripped out. Well, they're probably doing something. And they're probably identifying things coming in through the nose or they're probably the processing unit. I imagine it happens inside the uh, nasal airway and in the turbinates and all this area here. They're probably sampling the air coming in. There's definitely filtrating stuff coming through. There's a filter system here. And it then recognises the stuff coming in and starts handing out party invitations. It puts the stuff that's coming in there, it recognises it, it puts it on the guest list and says, right, well, this came through the nose. This is the normal stuff in the air around here. Now, if you breathe through your mouth, the air comes straight into your lungs. You've got antigens and stuff that arrives in your lungs that ain't on the guest list. And your body will react to that in a very different way to stuff that has come into the same place, into the lungs, but it came through the nasal airway. It got registered. It got put on the guest list. And, you know, you say, fine, we recognise that stuff. Any reaction you start in the lungs gets turned down because you, you, you chose to breathe it. It was normal background air. And of course, if you're breathing through your mouth all the time, particularly if you're breathing your mouth, when you're indoors, you're asleep, you're in a bedroom full of antigens. You know, have you ever drawn the curtains in the morning and you get the shaft of light comes through the room in you know, those particular sunny days and you can see in this beam of light. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, full, it's, it's full. full. Of full of particles. Now, it's you only see it when that beam of light comes in, but it's there all the time. Mm. And it amazes me, I've, I've tested that actually, because I've then opened the window. It's amazing, come in 10 minutes later, this beam of light's still there, no bits. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how they will clear out. Mm. I think the other point which is really important, which is often missed, is that nitric oxide is produced within the nose when you breathe through your nose. Mm. Is, it, is it not produced frequently or anyway? No. If you um, mouth breathe, a tiny amount is produced. But if you breathe through your nose, a considerable amount is produced. How, how do people know that? I've, I've read that in scientific journal. I mean, I've read that in, 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 physiology, in a physiology book. Okay. That's basic physiology. Okay. Basic physiology says that nitric oxide is released in the nose and it has two big effects. One is is bactericidal. So you were talking about these particles that have come in mm. that are pathogens. It will kill those. But more importantly, when that nitric oxide reaches the lungs, it's a vasodilator. So effectively, it's like the asthma pump. Mm. When you breathe through your nose, it has the same effect as that asthma pump in giving dilation in the lungs. Yeah. And you miss that completely when you're mouth breathing. Not completely, a very, very small amount of nitric oxide is produced when you breathe through your mouth, Pop. but predominantly when you breathe through the nose. So when we're talking about mouth breathing, there's two things um, I think that are really vital with nasal mm. breathing. One is the production of nitric oxide. And the other is you need to consider what the pressure is, the air pressure is within the nose when you're breathing through the nose. Yes. So when you're inhaling or exhaling, there'll be an increased air pressure within the nose. Mm, mm. And so there'll be a like a sine wave, there'll be a pulsation mm. of pressure yep. on maximum inhale and maximum yep. exhalation, there'll be zero pressure within mm. the nose. But when you're breathing, when air is passing in or out, there'll be an increased pressure. And so there's that what is postulated is that that increased pressure is one of the stimulants for the control of the growth and development of the bones. Mm. And it's that oscillating nature, the uh, fluctuation of the mm. forces, that is thought to be a bigger factor than just force itself. Yeah. Well, you know this thing called empty nose syndrome? No. Okay. Well, I've only learnt this from patients who have empty nose syndrome. And... They 
suffer from having a, a blocked noses, so they go and see um, an ENT surgeon, and the ENT surgeon takes a chisel and a hammer, and he cracks out one of the turbinates, mm-hmm. and then they have more space. Mm-hmm. And but apparently, there's a problem with this because they get this just horrific uh, feeling fresh, yeah. that. They they can't breathe. There's not enough resistance because apparently you need a steady change in pressure mm-hmm. from the front to the back of your nose, mm-hmm. of, of like a pressure gradient. A pressure from the front gradient, to the back. yeah. There's linear flow. Yeah. Of air, well, maybe not linear flow, but you know, flow pressure mm. through. And these guys just feel like they're suffocating all the time. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, I understand that. Because there's no gradient from the front to the back. Yeah, there's no gradient, apparently. Yeah. yeah. But so I think there's two important things why, no, apart from anything else, nasal breathing does those two things. It provides the nitric oxide, which is cleanses the air mm. and gives you vasodilation in the lungs and increases lung capacity. And the increased pressure that is fluctuating in nature that's rhythmical and it's that rhythmical nature of the pressure that is thought to de- uh, provide the stimulus for their growth. Mm. Mm. Those two things, which these children won't be doing that, apart from the fact that when the mouth is open, which is part of mouth breathing, the mandible is down and back with the tongue yeah. when the mouth is Encroaching open. Encroaching the airway. Encroaching the airway. Well, where yeah. else is it going to go? Yeah. And then what you see, particularly like this, then they have to... Tip the head back yeah. to keep the airway open. Yeah, extending the, the airway open. Yeah, so the autonomic nervous system will change the body posture yeah. in order to improve the airway. What's the most important thing in your life? Breathing? Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the most important thing in my life, you know. <laughs> yeah, breathing, yeah. Yeah, yeah the yeah, summer yeah. holiday is great, but, you know, I'd like that breath now, thanks. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Um, Much more important than than uh, eating? Well, yeah, it's more, it's more yeah, yeah, it's, it's a higher priority index, isn't it? You know, you, you breathe, um, water, dr- breathe, drink, and eat. Yeah. And that's what I mean, what, you can go 30 days or 28 days, isn't it, with well, no harm, no harm, no harm to yourself. Yeah. I know, a normal person, I think. <laughs> With no food. No food. I think yeah, yeah. I could think of some people who could probably go a little bit longer than that with yeah. no arm, but... Yeah, yeah. Without um, drink, without water, depending yeah. on the climate, but Yeah, yeah, yeah. Days. Summer, summer before last, I did a week starvation. Total week, total fast for a week. No food or water? Nothing, no, water, yeah. Oh, right, water. water. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I don't think I could go f- um, a week without water. No, I'd think it'd be a day or a day and a half. Yeah, but I went, I went a week without food. You know, my mm-hmm. Crohn's was playing up, and I yeah. thought, well, best thing to do, don't use the system. It's great, yeah. great for my Crohn's. Yeah. Yeah. But you can't do that for long. It's not yeah. a winning strategy, long-term strategy. Yeah. Yeah, great, great for the short term. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I, I, when I was struggling by the end of it. Mm. But it's amazing. You, you know, it's you know, not that bad. Mm-hmm. The first day was the hardest. Mm-hmm. But going back, going back to noses, you know, I, I see this a lot. Um, Zerino was getting a lot of blocked noses, a mm-hmm. lot of congestion, uh, often making sniffles and snorts and even mm-hmm. snoring a little bit at night. Mm-hmm. Gave her a bit of upper expansion, mm-hmm. lip taped her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> dramatic change. Just dramatic change. Yeah. I mean, if that happened to me when I was five or six, it yeah. would change my life. Yeah. I, I, I think that could change the life of a lot mm-hmm. of people mm-hmm. if they knew about it. Mm-hmm. I, you know, further research needed. Mm-hmm. Watch this space. Mm-hmm. But... To, but to breathe. F- but to make the point we're making, you, a month without food, a day or two without water, how long without air? Well, six minutes, I said. Six minutes. Yeah. Ago. Well, I saw that Jessica's got in watching these, um, some beach patrol in Australia. Yeah. And um, she's watching it like back on back through the day. And there we go. Yeah, yeah, it's gone three minutes. You can only do six. Six minutes brain damage. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And that, you know, uh, there's a lot of six minutes in a week. A mm. lot of six minutes in three days. Yeah, yeah. Breathing is top of the rest. Top yeah. of the list. Top of the list. Top of the list yeah. of what you need to do. And it's, you know, I um, I actually had a day the other day when I um, couldn't breathe out my mouth. Mm-hmm. It was the first time for, what, two years. Sorry, I just couldn't breathe out my nose. First day for two years. And I spent about two hours or so at night. I hated it. Absolutely hated. Worst sleep I've had in ages. Mm. Finally got up and did a neti pot, mm-hmm. which I highly recommend. 
Yeah. And I, I would recommend, I think, what, we all talk about people in Scandinavia having good facial form. Neti pots are really common, really common. You know, a, a lot of kids do it before they go to bed every night. Clean the nose out. Why not? You're brushing your teeth? Clean out your nose. You know, why not? This is the sort of thing that you go, oh, I could never do that. Well, try it once. Tell you the second time, fine. We're kids now. That's fine. I had to, the first time I did that was Arena. We had to wrap her up in a towel. I'm, I'm a mean daddy, aren't I? Um, but you managed to get it done. Oh, yeah. When we wrapped up in a towel, I was holding her wrapped yeah. up in a towel. You did it. And Miller did it, did the other yeah. end. Yeah. And we got the nephew. I just doesn't care now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're happy to do it. Normally, no, daddy, I'm going to do it. And that's the only cares about doing it itself. So, yeah, yeah, no phobia there. We clearly didn't cause a lasting phobia with the netty pot. But it's funny, sometimes, if I want her to do a netty pot, I'll say to Mel, come, let's do some netty pots. And she goes, fine, mm. I'll do a netty pot. <clears throat> Mel does a netty pot. And then Serena's there, you know, you don't have to say, you're going to do a netty pot. She mm. says, it's my turn now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're not doing it, I'm doing it myself. Yeah. Yeah, fine. But coming back to the breathing and the orthodontics, I think that's one of the areas where... There's a real division of understanding between traditional orthodontics and what you and I are saying. I recall that I went to a a lecture a few years ago in Australia given by the orthodontist for general practitioners. It was basically the message was refer, but it was uh, orthodontics for general practitioners. And it started off, the first slide, myths, orthodontic myths. Myth number one, breathing has no effect on malocclusion or words to that effect. Basically, that breathing has got nothing to do with it. And anything to listen to about breathing is just, um, well, quackery, essentially. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm considered a quack. You know, I had an orthodontist just two, three days ago saying, you know, orthotropics, um, I believe the higher form of quackery, I think he said. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I said, well, that, that's a little bit, um, what's that word, um, What's Johnny Depp suing Amber Heard for? Libel. Libel. I said, that's a bit libelous. And he went, said, then he... he, Don't try and prove it. After what, Rebecca and... uh, (laughs) Rebecca Vardy. Vardy. Yes. I wouldn't wouldn't sue anybody for libel. (laughs) I wouldn't go down that path. I I, I wasn't wasn't planning on it. It is just interesting how they feel they can just make these flippant comments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... But this is a guy who, who's never engaged with me, you know, never, never will engage in actual mean. No, none of them. Yeah. No, I've never had an orthodontist ever have a meaningful engagement with me, yeah. ever. I think one of the problems is, is that the economic model that's been developed in orthodontics is so extremely attractive mm. and so lucrative. And it's a system that's so predictable I mean, they can align them and they can glue them into place and they yeah. can do that. And it's yeah. an extremely lucrative practice. Yeah. And, uh, and you've got a, you've got a very... To be honest, it's relatively simple to do. It is. Re- oh, it's, it's incredibly simple. That's why... These you know, days. I mean, yeah. with these bonded brackets, particularly when you get the... You can place the brackets with the computer and do an indirect bonding system and they, you, can, you can buy the brackets and the wire and the, it all in one go. Hmm. I mean, it is not it's, it's that difficult. Solution. Yeah, mechanically. And then, but yeah. also, you've got a very compliant population. Yes, yes, they've you been have. trained. They've yeah, been have. trained, well yeah. trained. Yeah, well trained. They, they know they're going to get yeah. um, braces when they're braces. thirteen, and they, they're all they're all souped up for it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Except there's a new there's a um, there's a big fly in the ointment that I, a vast number of them. Yeah. And now, um, they've, they've got this, this mewing concept. They've understood what I'm talking about, cranium, and it's you know. I would it's a good number now and it will only grow because you know once the truth so Victor Hugo said nothing can stop an idea whose time has come Mm -hmm. and if we can continue to inform people out there the truth Mm -hmm. I think that number will grow that's our mission that's Mm -hmm. the mission with this station Mm -hmm. that's the mission with everything we're doing is to try to get the information out to people Mm -hmm. and try to make people realise well it's prevention we've got to aim for yeah, that's that's and prevention. The key to prevention is knowing what the etiology is. You've got yeah. to know what you're preventing. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the keystone, the cornerstone of medicine. To treat the causes, treat the cause, and to identify the cause is the key to treating the cause. And if yeah. we think that the cause is genetic, then that's really convenient. You know, oh, it's genetic. 
We don't have to do anything. Uh, no. <laughs> you, oh, no, we yeah. can't do anything. Yeah, you can, you can literally brush everything under the carpet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's time again. What do you think? Should we wrap that up for a day? Yeah, so, yeah, so, let's, so wrap let's wrap it up. Yeah, wrap it up. Yeah, wrap it up.